Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Palazzolo. Um, I work in, uh, I've been doing software and electronics on and off for a living for uh, quite a while now. And I've been involved in retro computing since it was called computing. Uh, and uh, I, this talk is about Demon Debugger. And I'm with my friend Evan Allen. We worked on this project together. Yeah. Um, my name is Evan Allen. Uh, I've been into retro computing uh, since it was retro computing, but even older. And the beige Macs were just the bad Macs. Uh, so uh, yeah, we worked on this uh, together for the past few years. Uh, Frank managed most of the software of it and the initial conception, and I uh, feature creeped all of the hardware. So I had something to do. All right, so that's the introduction. Uh, before I get into this, uh, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, how many people here have done software before? OK, that's a lot of people. Uh, how many people have written assembly language before? Oh my goodness. Wow. Most of them. Yeah. Um, and how about like electronics? That's still a lot. Okay, how many people know what I squared C is? Oh my. Okay. Well, that uh, Venn diagram is not what you might think if you're not looking from this point of yeah. view. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to change anything about the presentation based on those answers. Uh, I think we're good. Um, so what is Demon Debugger? Uh, everybody says I need to have an elevator uh, a pitch. So it's a flexible open tool used to repair and reverse engineer old computers. But by computers, I mean not just what maybe we think of as computers, but it, it also means game consoles, arcade machines, single board computers, et cetera. Um, so I don't want to dive into what Demon Debugger is today. I want to kind of go through a timeline of uh, how it started and how it evolved. Because I think it's actually a really interesting story of how a project gets, uh, how, how you get from beginning to end, and how a project evolves. Not that we're at the end. Yeah, not that we're at the end. It doesn't end. <laughs> um, so back in 2016, I decided it was time to take this lovely uh, Star Trek arcade machine that I purchased in 1999 uh, and try to repair it. Um, I have a few of these uh, arcade machines, and this thing has a card cage. I don't know if you can see that in there, but um, I knew that you know it can't be too broken. But it's been sitting, you know, and uh, so maybe it is really broken. Um, I knew that like I could kind of repair enough with like, one of these boards, get it to go. And uh, the conception that I had was um, if. I can get it to run a little bit. Can I use it to sort of help me debug it? Um, if I can run some code on here and there's a little bit of RAM, you know, I, uh, my first computer was a TRS-80 model uh, one that I programmed and then I got a model three. Um, and so I learned how to do Z80 code back in the day. And I'm like, mm, this is a Z80 machine. I can write a little bit of code on there. And then I can set it up so that if I can find a few IO pins in this arcade machine design, then maybe I can make it talk to me. And if I can make it talk to me, then I can have it sort of diagnose itself. Um, so I ended up with this, this architecture, which um, you, have, you have the target system that's running some code on, let's say, the Z80, and um, a handful of these wires. And I was using an Arduino Uno at the time um, to set up a communication link and then that Arduino Uno already is very easy to connect via USB serial to a PC. And uh, so I'm gonna go into this in a little more detail. Um, how did this work? Well, the target code that I ended up writing, this is basically custom Z80 code running for this. Um, I decided, for those of you who do know what I squared C is, which is almost everybody, amazingly, um, uh, that it becomes an I squared C master, essentially. Uh, a master because a master can run as slow as needed. It clocks the data at its own pace. Um, and the, the slave on the other end can just pick it up. Uh, and I actually didn't know how to do that, but um, I took a look on Wikipedia, and there was some code. This is a screenshot from Wikipedia on how to implement I squared C. So I made a C implementation and tested it out, and then I made a Z80 implementation. Um, yeah, Wikipedia doesn't just have pseudocode, it has code code. Yeah. You just pop it into a compiler and it runs. This was C code, I think they had Python on there too. Um, 
But essentially, the idea is it's a, it, it, there's a command handler, and it would take, um, it basically pulls the Arduino and asks, hey, is there a command for me? And the commands could be read or write from an address or a port, write, uh, uh, yeah, read or write, and then uh, execute some, some uh, code. And with just those three primitives and tiny kernel of code, you can basically take over and, and do whatever you want. Um, and it was talking to an Arduino Uno. Nice thing about an Arduino, it's easy to program. It already talks I squared C, so there's a hardware I squared C slave on that end. And um, uh, that code essentially just translates the messages from serial to I squared C. And so this is a pretty simple system. And then on the PC side, I just had a command line interface written in, in Python. Um, so that, that explains that picture that you saw a few slides ago. Um, this is maybe a little bit of a detail, but for hardware people, it's interesting. I decided that right away that um, the one complication of the I2C bus is that it's a bus, and so uh, use the same line to send data in both directions. And that's a little complicated when I know for a fact that I'm always going to have one target and one host. And so I said I didn't want to do that. Um, let's add another wire, and instead of having a, um, two wires in a ground, I'll have three wires in the ground and they can all have fixed directions. So on your target, I had to identify uh, two output pins. On the Star Trek game, I used the coin counters. There's coin counter mechanisms that, you know, it's two bits, there was like one on the left and one on the right side for the two coin slots. And I think, generally speaking, there's dip switches on an arcade machine and there's, you can just use those um, as inputs, so. Uh, the Star Trek repair was successful. Every one of those boards had a problems and uh, I got in there and I started interrogating hey I couldn't read the ROMs properly on the next board over in the card cage so figured out there was a you know an, um, a MUX chip that was bad and then I could read the ROMs and then something else something else soundboard speech board etc and uh, um, Demon Debugger is really key in getting this all working along with information from the MAME emulator I've been working on and off with MAME for um, since almost it was created um, and it's a great repository for information about arcade machines and you know, other computers. So, um, and I repaired the vector display and um, I, it's, it was all working until last year and now I have to start over and do that again, but that's the nature of those machines. Um, but I realized that the Z80 code was modular and it'd be really easy to adapt to another platform. Um, and then, you're just lucky that machine didn't catch fire. That's the one you have to have a fire extinguisher yeah, nearby. Yeah, I have a fire extinguisher nearby. And I made the three important hardware changes to like make sure it doesn't catch on fire. Because <laughs> if you forget to do that, yeah, it's a, yeah. For, for safety tip for people who own any Sega Vector arcade machines. Um, unlike Atari arcade machines, which don't have these same kind of problems, um, I got an Asteroid machine and it kind of worked, but it was missing some sounds and, and uh, had some vector distortion. And then I realized, hey, uh, I could just use Demon Debugger again, except this is a 6502 platform and not a Z80 platform. So um, uh, it was time to port the code. And uh, whoops, I don't want to go there yet. I did that. And uh, long story short, um, it was even e easier and more flexible. 6502 systems almost always have RAM in zero page. And so you can kind of just use the same code uh, from one 6502 platform to the next a lot of the time. Uh, the Z80 code, I needed to say, hey, on Star Trek, I know there's some RAM over here, and maybe on the next system, the RAM might be somewhere else. So, um, but Demon Debugger was multi-platform at that time with two hand-coded assembly language programs. Now, there are some fun uh, things you'll find with platforms like Asteroids, where they have a watchdog timer to see if, hey, is the code still executing? And the code is supposed to hit this watchdog timer once in a while. If you don't hit it, uh, the machine just gets into a reset loop. Is this the problem? Is it broken? Is, is there something else wrong? And the answer is no, the software was keeping it alive. So there's two ways you can solve this. One way is in the code, we have a provision uh, for things you have to do repeatedly. And it's defined modularly and it's very nice and it's easy to use. And you can just say, you know, execute this instruction to hit the watchdog timer and you do it every number of milliseconds. On the Asteroids game, there is a little circular metal ring that is soldered into it that has silk screen next to it that says watchdog disable. And you gator clip that to ground and you're done. Yeah. Atari did a lot of nice things like that on the hardware. They knew what they were doing. Um, 
Um, but yeah, as uh, I'll get into the structure of the target code in, in a little bit, but you'll see it's, it's really similar to uh, kind of what an Arduino would do. You, you a lot of times need to do some kind of initialization function, and then you need, might need to do some kind of function every time through the loop, um, which is like hitting the watchdog. So um, yeah, so this, you know, time goes by, and uh, I want to ask a quiz. Um, can anybody name, well, the console on the left? It's pretty easy. No? It's in Mattel and Television, right. Now what about the console on the right? Maybe you can read it, it's on there. Yeah, Tudor Vision. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, this is um, a very, I don't, I don't even know if this ever really came out. Uh, it was something that was supposed to be developed near the end of the life cycle of uh, Intellivision where World Book Encyclopedia was going to make um, educational themed stuff using a branded version of the Intellivision hardware. Um, it's an extremely rare console. I think there might be like a handful of these around. And the Intellivision has a BIOS inside, and it was known that the Tudor Vision BIOS must be different because the display is different. And uh, again, the emulator people and everybody else is interested in getting a dump of the ROM BIOS that's in here. But um, they're so rare that you know people don't want to have, take them apart. Um, so I started to think, hey, if we could use Steam and Debugger in some other way, that would maybe be a way to get the code out of the Tudor Vision and it'd be archived properly. Um, now this is where, this sort of deviates a little bit from the norm, but I, my friend of mine has this commercial product called an LTO flash, which is a flash cartridge for the Intellivision. And so it's really easy to put code on Intellivision if, you, if it's a well-known platform with a, with a flash cartridge. Um, but this also contains a serial connection. And so, you know, even though I have this elaborate system with the Arduino and I squared C and everything else, uh, my friend Joe who came up with this, I basically said to him, hey, if you write a serial version of this protocol for Demon Debugger and you put it on the cartridge, then I can take the cartridge to a show and plug it into a Tudor Vision and get all the data out that we need. And uh, so that's what happened. And um, it's interesting because it's a, that's, Technically, it's a CP1610 processor from GI, and we have a serial Demon Debugger core um, written for that. Um, and um, I'll bring this up again a little bit later. So this is a different hardware architecture, but basically a very similar software architecture for doing uh, a practical thing. And, it, and it's a little foreshadowing for the future. Yeah, so now we have it running on Z80, 6502, and this CP1610 great-grandfather of the PIC. Yeah, great-grandfather of the PIC. Um, so we start to get into this situation where, you know, what if we can't identify a few pins somewhere uh, and yet we have hardware that we want to um, tie into? And uh, a, a, an, another collector had one of these. Um, this is called a Bit90. It's sort of a ColecoVision derivative with a full keyboard and a built-in basic ROM. It's extremely rare. Um, and it was undumped up until a few years ago. Um, so, Was it just one or was it both of them? Well, we had, they, I think they were both undumped. Yeah. yeah. We found there were two different versions of this. It's a longer story, there are two different ROM revisions, but the only machine known with the newer ROM revision that we had access to was like pristine and we really, really didn't want to open it. It wasn't ours, it belonged to a collector. Um, so we started to think about, hey, we want to do something through the cartridge port and there isn't any special I.O. on the cartridge where it's just, it's just you can put uh, it's, it's, it's a all ROM input. interface there. It's right? all input. You, you, it's a yeah, ROM. It's, it's read only. So um, just open up a ColecoVision cartridge, and this is what you see. Um, there's three ROM chips in there. And started to think, well, hey, you know, we can fit our entire Demon Debugger. Oh, it's a Z80 machine. So we take our Z80 code and put it in there. We need to format it as a cartridge and give it a cartridge header and whatever. But it'll all fit in one of these chips. Then we can have commands to access the other two chips. And you started to think, hey, what if every time we access this chip, we made it do a read to the Arduino instead. And every time we access this chip, we made it do a write to the Arduino instead. And basically used access to this ROM as some form of communication to the Arduino. And if we did that, then uh, you know, we basically, we're, we're, we're in good shape. Uh, so, I have a picture here. This is, uh, this is another cartridge for ColecoVision. Um, 
you see we got a flash chip in slot one here. With a little bit of an adapter because the ColecoVision ROMs didn't use the standard pinout that we liked. But yeah. uh, but we stacked up, I think it was a 23XX adapter to a 27 series ROM. But we're running our code out of the first one, which I don't remember which memory page it is. I think it's A1000 or something like that, maybe B1000. Yeah. And then uh, then these lovely, this is all Evan's handiwork, <laughs> uh, lovely piggybacking of like a flip-flop chip here to capture the output data to go to the Arduino. And I think we have a MUX it's to a, grab the input data. It's, yeah, there's an LS244, um, yeah. and all it's doing is it's triggering on chip select, and it is just flat out ignoring every single address line that comes out of there. And it's just cramming whatever is on the input of the 244 to the output, which is directly coupled to the data bus. So it just lets you high Z the, the signals that are on the outside world uh, and let them through only when you're trying to read from a ROM. And in this case, it's not a ROM, it's, it's a buffer chip. And the 7474 is similar, except we needed a way to get output. But it turns out there are output pins on there. They're called address lines. So we hooked A0 and A1 up to the latch of the 7474. And we said, hey, uh, if you do a chip select, bam, there you're latched in. And what, do you, what have you latched in as outputs? You just latch in A0 and A1. So if you do any reads to that memory region, uh, if the A0 bit was a, you know, was a region where it was one, then you get a one on that pin. Or if the A1 bit was a one, you get a one on that pin. Uh, the unique thing about this though is because they're coupled to reads from the same region, you have to do them at once. So if we had, for example, th uh, three IO chips on this, if we had this broken into like four banks, we could have had each one individually addressed. We could have had the two outputs separate and individually addressable, and we could have the one input separate. We didn't, which means that there's a little bit of fun and games you have to play with the code where if you want to change the state of one of the pins, you have to change the state of both of the pins, and so you have to remember what the last one was, so you set them both at the same time. It's not super complicated, it was just, yeah. it was an extra hoop we had to jump through because of the hardware we designed at the time. But again, it was foreshadowing for uh, later stuff. Um, this is also, um, this is stuff that gets dragged into later designs because, you know, hey, we, we did it that way before, it was easy, it was cheap, you know, these chips are everywhere. So far, um, you can do this entire project with stuff that you find in a scrapyard or in the free table here or mm -hmm. in a credit card reader that's just, you know, sitting on somebody's table and you just pull out, you know, an LS, you know, 244 and a 7474, which are two of the most common chips aside from a 138 and bam, ready to go. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is like cheapest chips hardware. So far, there's nothing special. And, and it really, it worked great. Uh, this is a Z80-based system, working fantastic. And uh, we, then we started to get really uh, like, you know, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna buy in whole, uh, we're gonna buy in 100% to this idea of doing IO through memory mapping. Because we already have to replace a ROM in order to make Demon Debugger work. I mean, necessarily, you're gonna run your own code on the platform. You need to replace a ROM. Why don't we just use part of the ROM to do the IO? And, uh, so, you know, we start thinking about uh, what kind of a ROM, you know, let's, and the 2716 uh, is a standard JDAC pinout, 24 pin ROM, and it's backwards compatible with a whole series of ROMs, uh, the 24 and 28 pin ROMs that are, you know, pretty, uh, pretty common and pretty easy to adapt to. Even, even funny ROMs are close to those pinouts, and so with a little bit of adapters, It'll handle the bulk of what we want to do. Almost um, everything you can do with this is either directly drop it in, even in places that it doesn't look like it will fit, or uh, put in a passive adapter where you just wire these pins to those pins and it just works with nothing in between but wire. Yeah. So for example, we don't have pictures of this up here, but for example, if you want to drop by our table, you can see it. If you drop this into a 28 pin socket, you just justify it on the bottom and you leave the top four pins unconnected, and since we're not using the power pin, which is one of the ones up there, we don't care. Uh, all we need to be doing is ground referencing it, and all the pins for the lower section of the 28 pin ROMs are the same. And guess what? All the pins of the lower section of the 32 pin ones are the same. Because someone out there made a good decision when designing yeah. electronics. I think it's JDEC. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. Uh, and so we can use this from things that use 2716s all the way up through, what, one megabit? More? 
uh, mm -hmm. without changing anything. And if you want to go below that, we can get into this a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, we can do that too, just with a little bit of passive adapters. And please don't send negative 12 volts into this from a 2708 pinout. Yeah. Um, so this was our, one of our preliminary ideas for fitting into the 2K ROMs. We did this on uh, the next project, which I'll talk about. But what I wanted to say is, if you notice, the I.O. region is in the middle of the chip. Uh, and I'm, this is my question. Can anybody guess why we put the I.O. region in the middle of the chip? OK. Nobody here does cross-platform code. Yeah. It's, it's, getting, it's getting, uh, getting to the idea, yeah. Um, so what happens is we have Z80 and 6502, and they're sort of prototypical examples of a Z80 starts executing at zero. So you can't put the I.O. region at the beginning of the chip because you're probably going to plug the chip in at the front of the memory map where the Z80 is going to start running. Um, but wait a minute. You can't really put it at the back either because if you're going to put it into a 6502 system, you're probably going to put it into the last section of ROM because that's where the start address is, where it's going to boot to, and it's in the vector table. So um, we hide away from the front and the back and put it in the middle. Um, and you'll see we, we changed it up a little bit, but it's still, it's still not on either end. Um, so uh, the next thing we did was we tried to do, we already did a cartridge for the ColecoVision. Um, trying to remember exactly why we picked this. I think because we wanted to hack around with the colors for emulation work yeah, on this the Bally Astrocade. In MAME, the colors on the Bally yeah. Astrocade aren't 100% accurate even now. Um, so uh, this is a useful way to get in there and be able to run your own code to like, well, I, wanna, I wanna draw some stuff on the screen and then I wanna actually look at the colors, look at the color signals on a scope, whatever. Um, so you can see we actually did a, uh, a, a nicer board layout for the Astrocade cartridge. I don't think we have this anymore. I think this got cannibalized. Yeah, I, I pulled um, the parts off of that to build the next one, but we at least got a picture of it. And uh, miracle of miracles, this worked the first try. No yeah. modifications. Yeah, so it's like we're thinking we're hitting it out of the park. This is it, you know, and this is going to be our design. We're done. Um, so now it's time to make a PCB. So. Here we go. There and, it is. And remember, the Astrocade that we put it on here is Z80 based. Yeah. The Good. Gorf that we were trying it on was Z80 based. Yeah. The Star Trek we tried it on was Z80 based. And then there was this 6502 one that we ran it on at one point, uh, but that wasn't really what our development platform was. So um, we made this. Uh, look, hey, we can put the ROM on board now. Um, and. We can plug in this guy, and uh, everything's integrated, and it can still support tethered mode if we want to, where we have the wires going across and plugging the ROM into the target directly. Um, what could go wrong? Now, um, notice on this board, I'm only chiming in because I did the hardware, so I get to point these things out. Um, we have these wonderful dip to ribbon cable sockets mm -hmm. that are very nice, and you don't see them very often, and they're rather expensive. This yeah. board uses two of them. You don't have to do that. You could put a regular IDC 10th inch header on one end of it and save half the cost. We didn't I do think, that. I think your software guy was think, came up with that idea. Yeah, yeah. Somebody other than me designed this board. So uh, further revisions have different provisions for cheaper hardware. But that's OK, because it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what happened? We plugged it in, we went into, into back into the Asteroids game just to make sure it was going to work. It didn't work at all. It did not work at all. So what the heck happened? Um, well, this notion of capturing address lines as data um, worked really well on the Z80. But I, now I don't have a nice diagram, and I can get into it in all technical knowledge. But we're, we're trying to act like a ROM. And a ROM has a signal where um, basically when the ROM is selected, a pulse goes low. It goes low for a little while, and it goes high again. And somewhere in there, when the pulse goes low, the ROM is supposed to look at the address lines and go, oh, the address lines are there. I'm going to take some time, and then I'm going to find the data inside my ROM, and then I'm going to put it out on the data bus, and it'll sit out there on the data bus, and it'll be valid. Um, in the meantime, the address lines can go away or whatever. And it turns out that in general, uh, on that falling edge of that pulse, you can't always guarantee that the address lines are, are there yet. And on the rising edge, mm, you can't really guarantee that the stuff is still on the address bus. It's like it could be valid in there somewhere because these are asynchronous uh, chips. And um, 
modern digital design is all about synchronous stuff with like edges and things happen on edges. Signals are valid and then an edge comes and you know you need it. And, and the edges come in, in the design of um, one of these systems like inside the Z80 system or inside the 6502 system, there are clocks. They have clocks and they know when their stuff is valid and they use their own clocks. But the ROM doesn't know anything about the clocks. It just knows about this pulse. Now, so, now the data sheets for these ROMs are fairly explicit most of the time um, on saying things like the data will be valid at X amount of time after a load going pulse and they'll have tolerances on that. And so it's not like it's a mystery what's happening because right. these computers right. were designed around this and they work like that. But if we're trying to clock things on edges because that's how we're latching stuff into say our 7474, uh, we're going to have an issue because we can't use the chip select line to clock it in reliably, apparently, on every platform. It did work reliably on the Z80, and it may continue to work reliably on the Z80 forever because of how people made Z80s, and they just copied the mask, and they just keep producing silicon. But, so, yeah, we but to for, for multi-platform use, we realized at this point we can't guarantee that. So back to the drawing board, we I thought about it for a day or so and uh, realized that, hey, what we need to do is be a little bit sneaky. Um, if the stuff that we want to write to the Arduino um, was on the data bus and not on the address bus, then um, it would be a little easier to figure out when exactly it's valid. In fact, it would be valid on the rising edge at the end of the right pulse because that's when stuff is supposed to be valid. That's when... Um, for, for the most part. So uh, what we did is, you know, we had these I.O. regions and we split the I.O. region into two, a read region, and well, we already, we have split into a read region and a write region. And then what happens is um, if you want to read certain data, then we put that data into, I'm sorry, if you want to write certain data, we put the write data into the ROM at those locations. So we want to write a two Essentially what we do is we read from a location that has a two in it and we know that the two is in there. So when the right pulse comes by, um, it's like, oh, we need to grab this data. It's in the right region. What is the data? Oh, it's a two. So um, it's easy once you re realize that that's what you need to do. <laughs> so Yeah, there were some ideas of what to do before that. Um, this is those ideas. Yep. Don't do that. Yeah, don't do these things. Uh, we tried to delay things or maybe, you know, and this is like... There's uh, some R's and some C's. It was worse than inverters. this. We had, I remember there were piggyback chips on here after and more yep. caps. Yep. Um, meanwhile, these were also mistakes in, in Rev A. So we weren't done yet. Uh, and we realized they're, we need to do another board turn. They're not all mistakes there. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side, there's two power diodes like why are there power diodes in this what did we break that was so bad that we needed like rectifier diodes and the answer is we wanted to add features at this point as well and one of the features is uh, we want the logic chips to be powered by either the target right. or the Arduino side and we also want the ability to detect whether or not the target is present from the Arduino so we can do some smart things in the code there and what we did is we connected up the diodes in such a way that we can measure whether or not the target power is present from the other side of the diodes. The Arduino can know if you're plugged into a board, like, hey, please don't do stupid things uh, that yeah. might damage the board. Yep, safety stuff. And then, uh, and then I remember you wouldn't let this go. Uh, it was like, uh, you know, we're putting an EEPROM on here, but we're still requiring the user to have their own programmer. EEPROM programmer, uh, and then program the ROM, and then put plug it into our board instead of the target. But then we realized, hey, we've got an Arduino, we've got an EEPROM or a flash chip or whatever we're using. Why not just hook it up so that you can reprogram the chip while it's sitting in the board, and now you don't need your own chip programmer, and it's more convenient and easy. Um, we didn't take it to the step where it's completely isolated. So you can reprogram this, but you can't reprogram it while it's connected to the target. And we want, could have added know. a couple of extra uh, MUX chips or a couple of extra buffer chips like 244s or But we could detect when you're plugged into the target, sort of. Um, so you choose not to try to reprogram it there. 
So it'll tell the, the code would be able to tell you, hey, dummy, you're still plugged in. I refuse to try to program it because it's just going to not work. Uh, whereas we're t I'm still trying to keep the bill of materials on this project low, and I'm trying to keep it very common. Because I could keep the bill of materials low by using very specialty chips that only, you know, I can source from one place, and then uh, there's going to be some sort of pandemic, and then they won't exist anymore, and then suddenly a project doesn't work. Yeah. So I decided to source it with chips that are all between one and three times older than I am, and are still purchasable. Yeah. It's, it's a... It's a feature, right? I mean, we could do all programmable logic. We could do we could do this so many ways. There's so many ways to do these kinds of projects. That's the other thing. Um, uh, if you want to drop the cost of this board, you replace all the 74 series with a gal. I really don't want someone to have to learn win couple in order to make this project because yeah. I don't like win couple. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can see what we ended up wanting to do is uh, because we started off with the nano. We didn't quite have enough I.O. lines to do everything we needed to do with the flash chip, so we added an I.O. expander chip. And here's RevC. Um, RevC also didn't work. Yes. So um, Re RevC was where I decided, you know what? We'll just, we'll just add an I.O. expander. It's I squared C. Just, just throw it on the bus. It's fine. I've used these yeah. ones before. Uh, turns out someone yeah. was using I squared C in a way that I forgot. Yeah, and, and we can't both use the same I squared C. Uh, the because software guy and the hardware guy do need to talk about these things. <laughs> so if, if you remember earlier on, what is the Arduino? Is it the master or is it the slave? And then if the Arduino has to talk to this I squared C I O expander, what does it have to be, the master or the slave? Can you do both at once? We found out no. Yeah. So then it's like, oh, we have to do another board turn before this is ever going to be working. Um, we don't want to do anything else while we're at it, do we? Um, we need different I squared C interfaces. Um, we looked again at this business of where the I/O regions should be, and we decided let's shrink them down to make them as small as possible, and let's shove them towards one end, either the the back or the front, um, so that we can have a big chunk of code region in general. And then, if we have to make this work on a tiny ROM, um, we can play games with the selection of where that ROM goes and still have a big enough region to fit the logic that we need. So we haven't tried to do it in anything smaller than 2K. It fits in 1K, I think, in almost every target. Um, it, you know, in every target. It ought to fit um, in 512 bytes. We should yeah. be able to take this exact hardware we designed here with a little passive adapter and plug it into your Midway 8080 board that runs Space Invaders and Tornado Baseball and all of those other ones that has this beautiful ROM table telling you how to strap it for different ROMs. Um, I highly recommend that schematic uh, for reference for, for anything you're working on. It's very nice. Um, and so in order to be able to make this even more flexible, I added an extra 138. Oh no, the cost of an extra 138 on this project, I'm sorry. Um. Yeah, and we, you know, we spent a lot of time like, oh, do we really need these spare gates? Can we reuse? Can we reuse this uh, um, mux as a inverter? You we, know, we, we in did. fact did. We used <laughs> we we used one. Well, remember the first rev of this memory mapped I/O used a seventy four LS two forty four, eight bits wide. We don't need eight of those. We only need one. So we could use that, but it's a big chip. What can we get that's smaller that does the same thing? Well, the 74 uh, LS125 yeah, is a... four individually addressable one-bit MUXs, which is yep. great. It's the one on the right. Yep. Uh, but what do we do with the other ones? Well, if we want to have this even more flexible, it turns out with some pull-ups and some jumpers, you can play games with the MUX using it as an inverter. Uh, and so we did that. So now we have selectable chip select and uh, output enable uh, inversion. So that if you're using a board with ROMs that have positive chip select, because if you're looking at old you know, schematics, yeah. you find out that you used to be able to order ROMs, not only mass programmed, but the mass programmed ROMs could have selectable polarity chip selects. So you could just put them all in parallel even the chip select lines, and you would only select one of those chips at a time, which is great for cost-saving companies that cheap out on everything they possibly can, like Commodore, and not so great when you're looking at these things trying to say, how do I dump this in a standard way? It's not obvious. Yeah. And you might also notice 
um, underneath every 138 is a big whack of uh, small signal diodes because I did not want to add any OR gates to this. Uh, much less did I not want to add a 12-way OR gate or whatever that would be. So welcome to the world of diode ORs. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's really old school, but it's, it's, it has its appeal, I think. Um, so yeah, so we, we, we jammed the I.O. region to the back of the chip, and we left ourselves, they're 32-byte regions for reading and writing, and, uh, which is way more than enough. We really only need four, I guess. But, um, and then we have 32 bytes at the end, and uh, the biggest chip I could find that we're going to do with this is probably these... What is that? 65 c 65C816, which is the fancy Super 6502. It's the Super Nintendo um, processor. Which has, um, which has vectors that fill up this entire section. So, um, so of course, it was a 6502 variant that needed uh, extra space at that end. But yeah. that's the biggest one we could find that we thought we might use this on. So that's where we got 32 byte regions from. Okay, I'm going to speed through some of this stuff. There's way more we can talk about every different aspect of this project. But at, at this point, when I knew we needed to do code to do upload and download, I thought, you know, this command line thing is pretty arcane. And only someone who is really used to these arcane interfaces is ever going to be able to use it. So what, what if we had a GUI? What if we did some stuff? It was already Python, and it already has some GUI stuff built in. So I, I said, you know what, for the new features, I'm going to put them into a GUI version. So in order to reprogram the Flash, you do the upload and download with a separate Python script that is the GUI version. And uh, for 2.0, I'm going to pull all the features from the command line version into the GUI version uh, so that we have one version again. But in the meantime, we have sort of this uh, I'm using two different Python things for two different sets of functionality. Remember, for all features that don't exist, they're probably not going to exist unless you hold us to it. So please send emails, pull GitHub issues, demand that your use case for this, that you're actively using this project for, needs these features. Please help, and we will do it. Yep. But failing that, I have no guarantee that we won't just like something else. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of aspects to this project, uh, and not just over time, the difficulties, what features should we put in, how should we do it, but it, it kind of starts to expand, like, uh, oh, well, a GUI would be nice. Or for me, I was doing a lot of projects where, they, again, they're emulator-related, and I want to take over this target hardware, but I want to Act, and I want to control it as part of a larger system. Like I want to put some colors on the screen of this arcade machine, and then I want to like take a, a scope trace, and I want to do something else. And since I'm already in Python now, I want to drive it programmatically. So basically all the features of Demon Debugger that you can play in, with in the arcane command line interface are really a Python function. And uh, I'm not going to say that the Python API is gorgeous and beautiful right now. It needs about an hour of my time that I haven't put into it um, because it, it doesn't look great. But it's usable and um, uh, it's, it's close. So I think, um, and I've used it. I've used it for things. Um, I've used it along with a Rigol scope for data acquisition, screen captures, uh, a logic analyzer, and a RGB color sensor for some of this emulation work. So it's. It's really cool that you can just like take over a machine and, and put it into a control loop with a bunch of other things. Um, this is one of those things that you tack on to LXI or uh, GPIB instruments and just like, okay, I want the voltmeter to go, you know, the, the power supply to go to 4.85 volts, and then I want to set this color on the screen, and then I want to take the scope trace, then I want to crank the power supply up to 4.90 volts and do the same thing again, 4.95 volts, do the same thing again, and build giant tables, and you can characterize your hardware brute force, no math, and just say, okay, let's get, how does this hardware operate in real life? And then you can say, well, uh, when these arcade machines came out of the factory, they were calibrated to this, but as they drift over time, they have a much bigger range, and oh yeah, that's why people think this color is normal, because this, you know, this cap, dries out over time, this voltage shifts a bit, and then suddenly everyone's one looks like brighter red. And you can find those things out by just using this system to drive real hardware with real test equipment. So let me just say that that project is still ongoing and the colors are still not right in the emulator. <laughs> it still needs more work, but uh, we have all the building blocks at this point. Um, I don't know how long uh, do take more data has been on my list, but take more data is on the list. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so, okay, this slide has a lot of uh, stuff about the software in all the pieces, and I don't really want to go through all of it, but 
I, what I want to say is I spent some time looking at uh, the target code because every time I needed to add another target, it's like I'm cutting and pasting code for Z80 or 6502 and I'm making changes. And as a software engineer, professionally, it is starting to get on my nerves. So I said, and, and if anybody else is ever going to use the system, this isn't going to fly. So I, I, I refactored this thing probably two or three times over a weekend. And I finally uh, decided that, hey, okay, so for every target, you kind of have a template. We have a target for Z80s in, 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 uh, at the beginning of a ROM or 6502s at the end of a ROM. Then we have sort of a template for Z80s that are cartridges that are in the middle of a ROM and et cetera. Um, and for these targets, um, there's a template and then there's sort of holes in the template where, hey, um, maybe this system needs some special startup code maybe the system needs this watchdog thing. And so these green guys here are the ones that are, um, need to be replaced with special stuff. Um, in the end, I ended up with, um, I'm already using Python to build things. I'm using the, I don't know if people are familiar with the ASXXXX assemblers. It's a family of assemblers that run, they're multi-platform, um, the source is available, and they, they support many, many, many different processors. So on the back end, that's what's actually doing the assembling and the linking of the target code. But um, I decided to just go a little bit beyond the assembler syntax, which can be really arcane. And Python has this uh, shiny new thing that they've adopted. Actually, many languages have adopted called TOML. Um, it's Tom's minimal language, but the idea behind it is they look kind of like old school INI files from Windows, and they're meant for human editing of configuration data. And uh, they're, they're, they're getting built, it's getting built into more and more programming languages, um, and with good reason. We kind of need a component that does that. And so um, the system for building a target right now is there's a template file, and it's one of these TOML files, and it's referencing assembly fragments in the background. Um, and, and then there's, um, you can override the parameters of the target. For example, for a Z80, like I said, you might need to just use the Z80 template, but hey, my RAM is in a different spot on this target. And so you can override, hey, this is where RAM is on this target, and you run this DD make script, which builds new targets automatically, and um, there you go, you get a new bin. We did this yesterday for the microprofessor um, the microprofessor target that's sitting on our bench as one as our Z80 target example, um, and yeah, we changed one line and we ran DD make and there it is. There's been uh, download it done. So um, obviously for other things for other CPUs, there's going to be more to do, but this this makes things a lot easier. I'm I'm happy with it. I'm already thinking about the next version, but I'm happy with this now. Um, so I think at this point I'm going to let Evan sort of uh, take over, and he was going to do a quick run through of the physical features on RevD on the front side and the back side, and then I have uh, just some closing stuff after that. And I already went through most of this stuff. Um, so, let me see the mouse. Ah, sure. All right, so uh, I try to make this as flexible as possible. If you stop by our booth, you can see uh, all of the variations that we've put together uh, not, we have not put together all of the possible variations you can make with this board that I designed in, but we put together a lot of them. Uh, so we have here the Arduino. Uh, we use an Arduino Nano because it has built-in USB to serial, and most people just want to plug USB in. Up until now, up until this project, most of my stuff is built around USB Pro Minis, which is the same thing but cheaper and minus the USB serial, because most of my projects I just program, take the USB serial off, and leave it off but this is communicating with a PC at all times, so we might as well put it on. These, at the time of designing this project and at the time of bulk purchasing parts to make them, were ubiquitous and cheap. I have no idea what the state of that is today. I hope that is still reasonably close to true. Um, also a note, everything on this board is five volt tolerant. Everything on this board is five volt signals. It's not just five volt tolerant as in it's an ESP32 and it kind of isn't blown up by five volts, it's actually putting out five volts when you put a one on the signal. Um, you don't have to do that, but that's later in the slides. Down here, we have a six position jumper block, uh, which is selecting the polarities for chip select, or chip enable and output enable. 
Um, to the left of that is uh, the FAT. That is basically the key thing that muxes together the data lines. Uh, down here is a header where it's the same one we had from the first revision board we made, which jumpers the I squared C from the Arduino to the rest of the ROM IO interface. So if you want to populate this board minimally, all you need is the FET, two resistors, and the Arduino. That's it. You just take your I squared C, uh, four wire I squared C, you ground data in, data out, and clock out of this header and just plug it right onto the board, just like we did back in the days of using it with Star Trek. Yeah, and we have that running on the, in, the, in our exhibit, and it's called tethered mode now because it's different from Rama. Now, there's a couple extra features that went into this board specifically. This jumper down here, which is labeled J5, uh, we, I realized that we were like one jumper away from being able to completely bank all of the memory in and just cut our ROM IO out of the picture entirely. And so if for some reason you want to just... Just put a just, ROM just, in. Just put a ROM in the board <laughs> and then you want to run that ROM without any of our special stuff, you just move this jumper, everything is still fine. Everything just passes all the data from this ROM right back to the board. And you can program that ROM using this board and you don't need a ROM programmer, so it's like an, an extra now you, you still have to disconnect the, this from your target when you program it because we didn't add extra muxes, but uh, you know it was one jumper. You, you don't have to populate it. You can just put a wire link there if you want. You don't have to spend a header on it. Uh, this jumper up here is something that we added experimentally because we determined that, which one was it? The 6800 that had the extra chip select or was it the uh, sorcerer? Yeah. Some of the I don't remember the platform, but the VPP pin on, on a 2716 is sometimes used as a chip select on, by some architectures. Yeah, for some and, different non-27 series JDEC standard pinouts, they'll use that pin as an extra chip select. Yeah, and so it was we, the Sorcerer. And I, I was on the Exidy Sorcerer ROMs. And so we found that, you know, if we don't have any leftover gates on this thing, really, but... If we wanted, you know what we do, uh, if we wanted to allow for extra, extra platforms that use this as a high going chip select, you can jumper this over and you can use that as another chip select. So that also helps select the 138s. Um, and the last thing on, well, down here under the 125, we actually have one unused 125 inverter element, which if you absolutely need it, you can tie in as or 125 MUX element, which you can tie in as an inverter to that extra chip select line, so you can selectively invert that as well. So you can have up to three selectively invertible chip select lines on this board by wiring back and forth between things. Now, I have added uh, this header in the middle here, which is 24 pins, but it is 10th inch spacing. It's not 0.7, like using those really expensive ROM to dip or dip to ribbon cable adapters, so you can put a standard end on this end of your ribbon. Or I have, in parallel with that, a regular 24-pin dip setup, so you can just put male pins sticking out of the bottom of it and plop this thing on your board with no ribbon whatsoever. Now, I didn't spend a ton of time contemplating which orientation would be most likely to not interfere with things. I just stuck it on one side of the board and said, if you get to use that, good luck. Uh, it was an extra feature that we've literally never used, but I added it yeah. in there just because. Yeah. Um, these boards also, um, every value of every component is on here. Uh, there are some refdeses, some of them I just don't care about. Uh, there's also plain text on the back. Uh, yeah, go ahead. That explains to you in clear English, the minimal interface is these parts. If you want to uh, use a 2816, you should stuff these parts. This jumper is for doing this. This jumper is for doing that. Please disconnect before programming. You shouldn't have to look at any documentation other than the board in order to both assemble and use the board. Um, I, re I didn't have a time to test any of these boards before VCF, we just pulled all 30 of them, and I said, I really hope it's fine because I want to hand these out at VCF. Uh, let's hope nothing is wrong, and I don't have any errata. 
the one bit of errata that we have is these are all labeled as HCT chips. Uh, that works in most cases, uh, and there are software fixes for some cases that we found where it doesn't work, but you know what? If you stuff them with LS, everything works. <laughs> Just cheap out on the chips, and your projects will be fine. <laughs> All right. So I just want to wrap it up here and say, um, where are we going with this? Well, um, we want to do more CPUs. Yeah, just two weeks ago, we added 6800 and 6809. Uh, two people that I met here were like, will it work on the 1802? Um, the answer is it's in my short list. You know, I, we've been acquiring every uh, little single board computer that, or, or cartridge or whatever we need to make these things work. I purchased um, a couple of 8051 dev boards at Con so that I could use this as a development platform to develop 8051 ones because the last 8051 dev board I had had a muxed ROM. These ones don't. These ones have standard ROMs. So that's uh, so we're doing that. We want to do more platforms. Uh, right now, everything should run on Linux and Mac uh, with with the right executables, and they they are all buildable on those platforms. But the whole system is like set up to just use binaries on Windows and Python. Um, so we want to do that. Uh, we want to keep improving the system for the target code. We want to finish off the GUI, make a real GUI, not just a wrapper around that uh, command line program. We want to have more users. So we're giving away boards, and uh, um, we want to add more documentation onto the GitHub site. And uh, you know, the far future, maybe at some point, this thing like hardware goes poof and we use a Pico instead or something, but yeah, the, these, these the, are things that we're just like, you know, future. That was what I was saying earlier about um, everything on this board is real five volt, not just riding the diodes five volts. Uh, we could replace this entire board with a Pi Pico and bi-directional level shifters and some very clever code in the PIOs that I don't know how to write, but I watched about six YouTube videos from people who figured it out. Yeah, and I'm, like, I'm watching them too. We're contemplating it. I've been doing software for 25 years, but it's it's tricky. There's special stuff on those Picos. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I want to thank everybody who stopped by our booth. Please feel free to stop by. We're in C01. Uh, you can see we've been doing demonstrations all weekend. And, uh, um, we have bit, we started with 30 boards. I believe we populated six or seven of them uh, to use at our demo. Uh, we are down to seven left. Uh, anybody who stopped by the booth, and while it was on my mind, it seemed like they were interested or they were had a use for it, I handed them one and said, please, take it. I have seven left. If you want any and you haven't had one yet, or you think you have use for two of them, please, take it. Um, and this is the link for the repo. Everything we're doing is open. Um, expandable. You can do what you want with it. Um, all of this all is the code is there. All of this is Python. Uh, please pull issues against the GitHub repo saying that my silk screens are wrong. Please pull issues against the GitHub repo saying you needed a pull up here and why are you doing this poorly? I want to know everything and I want to know that people are using this because it motivates me to keep working on this instead of like the brand new X that I just bought. Um, yeah, and uh, there's our links to our uh, your. Um, blog, my blog, yep. and um, you can get a hold of us, hold of us through that. So I think we've used up all the time. Oh, so yeah. we'll say questions uh, at the booth. Thank you very much.